Today, I am a reluctant teacher. I'm reluctant because the topic is so gruesome. The topic is this, why did Jesus have to die such a horrific death? Scourging, followed by crucifixion. The pain and misery are unfathomable. It's difficult to even discuss it. In this country, the United States Constitution protects against cruel and unusual punishment. The Eighth Amendment in the Bill of Rights prohibits the kind of sentence that Jesus received. The penalty ordered by Pontius Pilate would not be allowed today in this country, even if Jesus had been an insurrectionist, as was alleged, which of course he was not. To be sure, penalties for criminal acts become more severe as the nature of the offenses worsens. And in the case of Jesus, the charges initiated against him by the religious leaders claims that Jesus was defying the authority of the Roman government and inciting rebellion in the region were serious charges. So if he had been found guilty of the charges brought by the religious leaders, the penalty would have been severe. But a sentence like the one imposed on Jesus is simply unthinkable. For starters, he was never convicted. In fact, the pilot, pilot, the Roman governor in that region, not once but twice declared that Jesus was innocent. Take a look at John 18.38 and John 19.6. The strange thing is that the penalty imposed on Jesus had been part of God's plan for hundreds of years. Why else would the prophets have been able to foresee the punishment that would be inflicted on Jesus? Before his agonizing death on the cross, Jesus had been tortured and beat beyond recognition. The prophet Isaiah, speaking for God approximately 770 years before the crucifixion, described the Messiah this way. He was despised and rejected, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. His appearance was disfigured, his form marred beyond any human likeness, that's Isaiah 52, 15, and Isaiah 53, 3. Isaiah continued, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. That's Isaiah 53, 4, and 5, and Isaiah 53, 10. The psalmist at the time of King David, more than a thousand years before Christ, described the Messiah as scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they hurl insults. That's Psalm 22, verses 6 and 7. And later, the psalmist added, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Psalm 22, 18. All these events took place hundreds of years after they had been prophesied. The suffering of Christ was no accident. It had been the plan for a long time. But the question is why? Why so severe? Couldn't God's objective have been carried out in a less cruel fashion? Let's go back to the beginning to better understand the circumstances that led up to the torture, abuse, and painful killing of Jesus. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, as Genesis 1, 27. Then he placed them in, the, in his garden and gave them godlike dominion over and authority over uh, his creation, as Genesis 1, 29 and 30. In the cool of the day, God would come and visit uh, Adam and Eve, see Genesis 3, verse 8. While humans were created with the ability to think independently and exercise free will, God nevertheless sought to have a meaningful relationship with mankind. He loves us. He cares about us. He wants us to be with him. But there came a time when mankind, exercising free will, rejected God. Rather than fully relying on God, Adam and Eve chose to follow Satan's distortions of the truth. The result was that a wall of separation occurred between holy God and sinful humans. Read Isaiah 59 too. 
Sin, which is defiance against God's standards, caused separation from God, and being separated from God is spiritual death. The Apostle Paul uh, uh, put it in truncated fashion this way, the wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6.23. God did not want mankind to be locked in a state of perpetual separation. Therefore, once sin entered the scene, God removed mankind from the garden where the tree of life grew. God could not bear the thought of us living eternally separated from him. Armed cherubim were posted at the gates to eternal life, barring sinful man from dwelling there with God. Read Genesis 3, 23 and 24. Humans needed a means by which to be saved from the effects of their own sin. So God began the arduous process of educating mankind about sin and its deadly consequences. In the book of Exodus, God enumerated godly standards for living. The boundaries between God's truth and Satan's distortions became explicit. In the book of Leviticus, a system of substitutionary death through animal sacrifice was put into place as a temporary measure for restoring a relationship with, between God and mankind. In an act of repentance for the sins of the people, the priests figuratively placed the sins of the people on innocent animals that were then put to death as a substitution for the spiritual death generated by people's sins. But that solution covered the people only until their next act of defiance. So the dilemma remained. A permanent solution was needed for removing the sins of mankind past, present, and future, so that humans could be assured of having access to eternal life with their maker. The irony was that death was the penalty required for the payment of sin, and if a person had to die in order to right things with his or her maker, that would defeat the purpose of reconciliation. A relationship between God and humans required life, not death, for the sinner. God never did desire animal sacrifice. Read that in Hebrews 10, verses 3 through 8. That was a temporary measure to educate mankind about the dead, deadly seriousness of sin and to acclimate him to this concept of our guilt being borne by another. God's plan for substituting our guilt was foretold by the prophet Isaiah. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. That's Isaiah 53, 11. Paul's letter to the early church in Corinth explained that Jesus' death had provided a lasting forgiveness for those who were committed to Jesus. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5:21. The paradox is that restoring an unblocked relationship between God and mankind required God himself to enter this sin-sick world as one of us and pay the penalty for sin once and for all. So God entered this world as a human for the purpose of bearing the penalty of all sins of all mankind, past, present, and future. Bearing that punishment was enormous. Knowing that the penalties increase as infractions worsen, Jesus came into this world to suffer the penalties for a universe of sins, including those gut-wrenching offenses committed by the very worst of offenders. That's why forgiveness is available to all who repent of their sins and accept the gift of salvation through Jesus. Read Romans 10.8. He paid the penalties, all of them. Justice requires a punishment fitting the offense. For example, Exodus 25, 4 states, if the guilty person deserves to be beaten, then he shall be flogged the number of lashes deserved for that particular offense. Increasing the intensity of flogging to a level required for offsetting a world of sin for all time led to the scourging that Jesus endured. Read John 19, 1 through 3.
Sharp pieces of bone and shards of metal were embedded into the ends of the leather strands of the whip so that the flesh on Jesus' back and sides were deeply torn. He was mocked and despised as if he were guilty of vile criminal acts. Read Matthew 27, 26 through 31. He was forced to carry his cross as if he were a common criminal, and he was led to the execution site where he was stripped of his clothing, and that was divided amongst his executioners, read John 19, 16 through 24. Then nails were driven through his hands and feet, and the cross to which he was nailed was dropped into the ground, starting the grotesque process that ultimately led to Jesus' death. Read John 19, 28. So the gruesome intensity of punishment inflicted on Jesus was inhumane. But two points are driven home by his abuse, torture, and death. Point number one, sin is serious. It has deadly consequences. And number two, God loves us so much that he sent his only son to suffer the penalty for the sins of mankind once and for all, for everyone, John 3.16. The scope and intensity of sin amongst us determined the ferocity of the penalty Jesus bore on our behalf. So reflect with me, if you will, on these questions for introspection. Question number one, why does justice require punishment that is commensurate to the crime? Question number two, Jesus taught his followers to love each other as he has loved us, read John 15, 12. How can we apply that degree of love in our Christian walk? And question number three, what actions do you take that are prompted by the extreme sacrifice Jesus made on your behalf? The punishment inflicted on Jesus was painful, grotesque but that was the requirement to cover the sins of mankind and restore our eternal life with God. As his followers, we are called to deny ourselves, take up our cross, that's Matthew 16, 24. We are called to acts of sacrificial love. May we constantly find ways to love others as he has loved us. Music